Okay, today we come to Matthew chapter 16, and we begin our study in verse 1, going through verse 23. Matthew 16, verse 1, after prayer, Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And of course, you know that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were religious sects of Judaism, and they hated Jesus because they were jealous of him. Jesus has calmed the storm, raised the dead, healed many sick people of even incurable diseases, cured paralytics, drove out demons, multiplied bread and fish, and fed thousands. He's done these things too many times to count. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees were not satisfied with all the miracles that Jesus had already done. Now they want a miracle from heaven. In other words, do a miracle in the sky, is what they're saying. Like, reverse the sun. Reverse the course of the sun or, you know, cause the stars to fall down or something like that. Verse 2, he answered them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. In other words, you can predict the weather by looking at the signs in the sky, but you can't see that I'm the Christ? Even though I've already done too many miraculous signs for you to count? The Jews did not lack evidence concerning Christ. They chose not to believe in him because they were jealous of him. It's not that they lacked evidence for the truth, it's that they didn't want truth. That is a very dangerous position to be in. To not want truth because somehow you don't like the truth. You play that game. You set yourself up to have your heart hardened. Verse 4. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign shall be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Jesus is saying, you'll get one more sign. After I'm dead for three days, God will raise me from the dead. And that will prove that God is on my side, not yours. And it will also prove that those who reject me reject God and doom themselves forever. And you know what? God did give them this sign. Remember? Jesus was raised from the dead. The angel came, rolled away the stone, the Roman guards who were set there by the Pharisees and the Sadducees witnessed it all and they went and told the Sadducees and the Pharisees what had happened. They got their sign and they made up a lie. They rejected even that sign. That's the trouble with not having a heart for truth. 5. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And so the disciples catch up to Jesus. But they forget to bring food. So they're thinking, well, we forgot to bring food. And now we're going to have to tell Jesus that we forgot to be, bring food. 6. Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they discussed it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. So they think that Jesus knows about them not bringing food. And they think that Jesus is talking about the leaven or the yeast that is in bread. And they're thinking, well, Jesus knows we didn't bring any food. And he knows we're going to have to go buy some food. And 
he knows that we need bread, but he doesn't want us to go buy it from the Pharisees. That's why he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes. Eight. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O man of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves the fact that you have no food? In other words, why are you guys concerned about food? Why are you thinking about food? Why are you talking about it? And why do you think that I'm talking about food? Food should not be a concern to them. If anything should not be a concern to the apostles, it should be food. And in verse 9, Jesus tells us why. Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? You know, why are you concerned about food, is what he is saying. And why would you think that I would be concerned about food? They've been without food before, but Jesus always managed to do a miracle and feed them. So why are you worried in even thinking about food? It was a lack of faith, Jesus said, that caused them to worry about not having food, what they needed. When we put Jesus first, we shouldn't worry about having what we need. He promises to take care of us. 11. How is it that you fail to perceive that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. It, and they should have caught on to this earlier, I, I would say, because it was common knowledge that in Scripture, yeast or leaven is symbolic of sin and false teaching. And so Jesus is saying, beware of the sin and the false teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were hypocrites. They pretended to be good, but they were not good. The Sadducees were not hypocrites, but they were unbelievers, basically, because they wouldn't believe anything which didn't make sense to their puny, rationalistic little human minds. As far as the Sadducees were concerned, if they couldn't figure something out, then it must not be real. Or if they didn't see something, then they didn't believe in it. That's why they didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in hell. They didn't believe in a resurrection. Jesus is saying, don't be hypocrites like the Pharisees, and don't be unbelievers like the Sadducees either. 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that the Son of Man is? And that is the most important question that each person must answer for themselves. Who is Jesus? Who do you say Jesus is? What do you believe about Jesus? That's the most important question of all. Because to get that answer wrong, and as a result reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, will mean eternity in hell. People need a clear understanding of who Jesus is. People need to know what he has done for us on the cross. And people also need to know what he demands from us. Those are questions which no one can afford to ignore and no one can afford to get wrong. Who is Jesus? Who do the people say that I am was the question. 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And they were all good people. I mean, people had a positive, you know, um, a positive opinion on Jesus. Except for the scribes and the Pharisees, they hated him. But the general population, oh, yeah, he's a good man, he's a holy man, he's a prophet, something like that. And those are all nice. But saying that Jesus was a prophet and a holy man sort of misses the point. That would be like answering the question, who was Winston Churchill? Who was Winston Churchill? Well, he was an Englishman. Yeah. 
What else? Well, he was an Englishman that liked brandy and cigars. Okay. But if you stop there, you're missing the point. Sure. He liked brandy and cigars, but he also just happened to lead Great Britain during World War II and help save them from Hitler. <clears throat> so you miss the point. And it's the same with Jesus. Yeah, he was a prophet because he spoke the word of God, and he was holy. But he's also the eternal son of God who died and paid for our sins on the cross. You leave that part out, you're missing something. But that's what people were thinking. And then verse 15, Jesus said to them, to his disciples now, but who do you say that I am? In other words, <clears throat> excuse me, those who don't hardly know me have all sorts of opinions about me. But Christ says, you who have been with me for so long and have seen my miracles and have heard me teach, who do you say that I am? What do you think? 16, Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, so Peter takes the lead, and he speaks for the others, and says, You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. Now, if you say that to some people today, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the only Savior, the only way to heaven, there are those who will say, Well, that's just your opinion. New Agers have a totally different opinion on Jesus. That's just your opinion. No. No. It's Peter's opinion, and it was the correct opinion because God inspired his answer. And we know that God inspired his answer because Jesus himself said that God inspired his answer. Look at verse 17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. God the Father revealed that great truth to Peter concerning who Jesus is. Flesh and blood didn't. God did. You can tell others that Jesus is the Son of God, the only Savior, and you can do it with eloquence. However, the ability to translate those facts into a conviction in their minds can only be done by God himself. God is the only one who can pierce a sin-darkened mind and convince that mind that Jesus is who he claims to be. You can be eloquent, you can be persuasive, you can put together a great argument, but you can't convince anybody the truth about Jesus. It can only be done by the Holy Spirit. 18, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the powers of death or the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus says to Peter, You are Peter, means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, Jesus is called the cornerstone of the church. Without Jesus, without his death on the cross, there's nothing. It's his church. He bought and paid for it. He suffered and died for it. He's called the cornerstone. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, all the apostles are pictured as being part of the church's foundation. But here, we can't overlook this, Peter is singled out as being the foundation stone upon which Jesus will build his church. It's Jesus' church. He can build it any way he chooses. He has chosen Peter. And there, there are some evangelical Christians who refuse to believe that Peter is the rock. They say, well, no, it was Peter's confession of who Jesus was. That's the rock. From the very beginning, the church has always taught that Peter is the rock that Jesus was talking about here. And it's not just Catholics. There are conservative, Protestant, Bible teachers from the past and well-respected ones in the present who say that Jesus was speaking to Peter and Peter 
is the rock. There can be no doubt about that. And they make statements like those evangelicals who say that, no, it was Peter's confession, not Peter. It's just an overreaction to the Roman Catholic teaching that this is Peter. That's true. So it's not just Catholics who believe that Peter's the rock. It's Catholics and Protestants. Some well-respected ones. This may help. This may help you to get it if you are concerned. <clears throat> Jesus made three statements to Peter in verses 18 and 19. And after each statement he made to Peter, there was an explanation of the statement given to Peter. Let's read verses 18 and 19 again. Watch this. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of hell, or the gates of hell, shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Three statements made by Jesus to Peter. After each statement, there was an explanation given. Both the statement and the explanation pertain to Peter. Statement number one, verse 18. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. That's the statement. Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. Explanation given to Peter. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Then skip down to statement number three. Jesus says to Peter, here's the statement, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. What's the explanation? Given to Peter, you have the power to bind and loose. Now if the first statement and the third statement pertain to Peter, and the first statement, the first statement and explanation, the third statement and explanation belong to Peter, and they clearly do, then the second statement and the second explanation has to belong to Peter as well. You are Peter. The second statement, which means rock. Explanation. And upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. It's the same word. Don't be fooled by those who say that one means big rock, another one means little stone. They're both the same word. There's no distinction in the Greek at all. You are rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Peter is the rock. And I just want to go over a few verses, and this is just a small sample. We're going we're gonna to go verse by verse here, and we're going to see if the Bible bears witness to this truth, that Jesus is this rock, this foundation. And we can begin right here, Matthew 16, 18 and 19. I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. And I will give you, Peter, the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Start there. Then you can go to Luke chapter 22. Jesus says to Peter, I have prayed that your own faith, Peter, may not fail. And once you have turned back, you, Peter, and he didn't say this to anybody else, you must strengthen your brothers. Mark 6, 7, God sent an angel to Peter to announce the resurrection of Jesus. Acts 1, 13-26, Peter led the meeting which elected the apostle that replaced Judas. Peter led that meeting. Who's in charge here? Who's the rock? Acts two fourteen. Peter led the apostles in preaching on the day of Pentecost. Peter took the lead in the church from the very beginning. He preached the very first message on the day of Pentecost. Very first message ever preached in the church was preached by Peter. Acts 15, Peter led the meeting which decided on which terms Gentiles would be led into the church. He led that meeting. Acts 5, Peter was the judge of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that? Ananias and Sapphira lied. They lied to the Holy Spirit and Peter pronounced judgment on them and that judgment was backed by God in heaven. John 21, Jesus entrusted Peter with his flock. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. Acts 3, Peter did the first miracle on the day of Pentecost. After the day of Pentecost. Galatians 1.18, after his conversion, the Apostle Paul went to see Peter. 
Throughout the New Testament, whenever the apostles are listed as a group, Peter's name is first. Sometimes the apostles are referred to as Peter and the Twelve. Now that says something. And talk about preeminence among the apostles. Peter's name is mentioned in the New Testament more than any other apostle. It is mentioned 191 times. Second place belongs to the Apostle John, 48 times. More on this in a little bit. Let's look at verse 18 again. There's something else I want you to see. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the powers of death or the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, this is very important. Jesus is saying all attacks against the church will ultimately fail. Jesus will not lose. Cults will come and go. False teachers will come and go. Anti-Christian atheists will come and go. But the church will survive everything the devil throws at it because Jesus will not lose. And if you're in the church, you will not lose either. Verse 19. The third statement and explanation made to Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, key to this whole thing is understanding these words of Jesus Christ the way Peter and the apostles and all Jews of that day would understand it. And I'm about to give you the definitive answer as to what this verse means. There is no doubt in order to do that, I have to bridge the cultural gap, the language gap, and the historical gap, which every good Bible teacher ought to do anyway. But if I can bridge those gaps in your mind so that you can understand Jesus' words here exactly the way the apostles and Peter and the Jews of his day, Jesus' day, would understand it. I want you to understand these words the way the apostles would naturally understand it. So let's read verse 19 again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The ancient kings, and this is common knowledge to Peter, the apostles, and all Jews, the ancient Israelite kings had many assistants who would help them rule the country. You can read about it. You can read, for example, read about David's reign. And there are scriptures that list all the men, a bunch of men, who were his ministers in his kingdom, servants who were in charge of different areas of the kingdom. They helped him rule. They were his servants. So, ancient kings of Israel, including David, had many assistants who helped them rule. But each king had one top assistant who was in charge of all the other assistants. And, and he was sort of like the prime minister. The other ones were all ministers, helpers. He was the head of them all. He was the prime minister. In fact, there's an example of this in Isaiah chapter 22. The king of Israel had a prime minister named Eliakim. You can read about it in Isaiah 22, exactly what I'm talking about here. Anyway, the king would give his prime minister complete control of the kingdom. Total authority. He was, he was in charge of all the king's servants. He was in charge of all the other ministers. He had power to make laws. And to enforce laws, to say what was right and what was wrong. The prime minister was given full authority to be the king's representative ruler. And here, get this now. That authority, common knowledge by the apostles and Peter and all Jews, common knowledge, that authority that the king gave to his prime minister was commonly known as the keys of the kingdom. So, when you see Jesus giving Peter the keys to the kingdom, the church, you know what they understood by that. 
Jesus was saying, Peter, I'm putting you in charge of my church. All my other ministers must answer to you. You have an anointing from me to bind and loose. That's what the keys of the kingdom mean. You have the power to bind and loose. In other words, you have, an, you have the power, Peter, to pronounce what is correct teaching and what is heretical. The keys of the kingdom also includes the power to discipline church members and if need be, excommunicate them. And if you study the early church and the book of Acts, you're going to see Peter exercising this authority. And so, watch this now. Peter answered the question, who do you say that I am? Peter identified Jesus as the Messiah, as the King. And then Jesus shows his royal authority by giving Peter something a king could only give, and that's the keys of the kingdom to his prime minister, and he put Peter in charge. But we're not through yet. Verse 20. It says, Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Well, the disciples clearly understand that Jesus was the Messiah. They confess that. But Jesus was not the type of Messiah that the general population thought was coming. They expected the Messiah to take charge and overthrow Rome, the Roman Empire. But Jesus didn't want the apostles to tell the people that he was the Messiah until after they understood what kind of Messiah he was, see, until after he died and rose. He didn't want the people to rally behind him with the hope of overthrowing the Roman Empire. 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. The disciples, like the other Jews, misunderstood the nature of the Messiah's kingdom up until this point. They thought he was going to overthrow Rome also. But Christ is trying to set the record straight, beginning right here. He's warning them, I'm not going to overthrow Rome. He's saying, I'm warning you ahead of time that I'm going to be murdered. And then he also mentions that he's going to be raised after three days. Of course, the bad news about being murdered was so bad that the good news about being raised went right over their head. It didn't even click. 22, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Boy, was Peter wrong. You see, Jesus gave Peter the authority. He gave him the keys of the kingdom. Gave him power, the top guy. He gave him the authority with those keys to, to pronounce correct doctrine, but only in an official setting, like a prime minister would. You know, not everything a prime minister says is law. Only when he is sitting in his chair as an official of the kingdom, and he pronounces judgment or makes a law officially but not everything a prime minister says or does is 100 percent accurate and he, jesus never said that peter would be without sin jesus gave peter the authority to pronounce correct doctrine in an official setting but he never said that peter would be without sin that's not what the keys of the kingdom means giving P peter the keys of the kingdom did not mean that peter would be sinless did not mean that everything Peter would ever say about anything or anyone would always be 100% correct. It just didn't mean that. Nobody understood it to mean that. The keys only guaranteed that when making a statement on faith and morals in an official setting, like a prime minister, Peter would be granted the ability to speak the truth. 22. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter says, Lord, you are wrong. Well, what kind of a nutty statement is that? Lord, you are wrong? A Lord can't be wrong. But it gets even worse. Jesus, no way are you going to be crucified. Well, look at Peter, or look at what Jesus says. 23, but he turned and said to him, to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not on the side of God, but of men. You don't know what you're talking about. 
You know the problem with getting upset with God because he doesn't do what we want him to do? The problem with getting upset with God or thinking that we know more than God is that it is, number one, blasphemous. But also, we are not as smart as God. God has all the facts. We do not. So it's foolish to think that we know better than God. You know, if Peter could have gotten his own way in the flesh, Jesus never would have went to the cross. He never would have died to pay for our sins. And we, along with Peter, would all go to hell. Okay, we'll pick it up in verse 24 next time. Until then, so long everyone.